In Gordy's manual, he writes, This exercise does consist in two general members. The one is the instruction, and the other is the practice of the learner. The instruction is done by a master of the nature. After all, the life is in the instruction itself. The instruction of the master is by word of mouth or active showing the learner by drawing before him. It is fit and necessary that the learner apply himself to a good master so that he may gain a good hand in drawing and a well-grounded knowledge in ordering his figures and making them of actions requisite that after he comes to behold the life itself, he realizes his own genius and his own exercised reason. Gorhi provides some intermittent advice, encouragements, and reasonings throughout his instructional manual, which uncovers some interesting insights into the 17th century drawing mindset. For the picture drawer just starting the very first lines of a drawing, he expounds, Assure yourself of every stroke which you are to draw, with good reason and observation, taking good heed upon the great and general part, omitting the small breakings of other parts, and in doing so shall you attain not only readily but also judicially and with pleasure to your purpose. But contrarywise, if you begin your drawing without observation, without considering, then shall you, having made your draft, draw the same over and over again with little or no purpose, and be overwhelmed and overcome with melancholy, and extinguish your genius or spirit. Therefore, I desire that learners will take diligent heed to their passions and to their adverse inclinations. Overcome these with patience and magnanimity to make a firm purpose so that, on that which you otherwise made account to draw in two or three hours, you rather bestow a whole day or two on it, and so doing, you shall not only proceed slowly and prudently, but you shall finish sooner than you thought, and better than what you should have done otherwise. Notice in this drawing the painter has loose-leafed reference drawings or prints scattered on the floor, and one on the easel next to his painting. Of importance, which needs further discussion, is the regard for movement or actions within living forms. This must be present in the start of every sketch, as Gorhi mentions. The actions must show themselves in the first and the rudest sketch very apparently, in regard that actions are the life of a picture and by consequence of your drawing. Use care when drawing a sketch neater and neater that you lose not the action, which easily may happen if you do not consider the bendings or turnings of the several parts within the actions of a figure or figures. I provide some of my student works as examples. The outer two were drawn from original museum sources, the middle image from a book reproduction. Directly observing and sketching from 16th and 17th century master sculptures Paintings, prints, and drawings is an immediate way for one to recognize the inner lines of movement within the forms and how to maintain that action during the workup of a sketch. Gesture sketches were to be accomplished with unconscious eye-hand coordination and to be intuitively in proportion. Gorey recommends that unskilled drawers should place themselves with those who are experienced. Thus, in the guild workshop environment, a beginner was always in the company of advanced students. He who is unskillful in drawing after the life should place himself next unto a well-experienced draftsman to see and observe his manner in drawing after the life and be resolved by him now and then in his doubtings that by this means he may come on the faster to be a draftsman. Gorhi advised that the learner should spend two days a week drawing after the life of a human model. If no master was available, he suggested to choose a college of eight or ten young men 
among which some are experienced to draw after the life. That may put you in the way if you are an outsider. The proper etiquette of the newcomer was also instructed. In the college you shall evade the inspection of another's work, neither shall you spend your time vainly to dispraise another man's work, but you shall quietly and modestly interest one another, and by good example proceed from the rest of your companions in diligent observation and care, taking heed what you are about. Show also one another his faults, according to the knowledge you have, with all gentleness and humanity, to the amendment of another's judgment. Next, some unique drawing techniques will be considered, the first being hatching. One of the qualities of copy books was the student's candid observation of and unconscious exposure to the visual depth effects and shading manners achieved through skilled line work. This is known as hatching. Woodcuts, etchings, and engravings required this knowledge, as seen in both the Dürer and Rembrandt images. Hatched lines can also be seen in paintings and in the expressive brushstrokes following the surface of the direction of form. For the picture drawer, Gorhi writes, You hatch with the pin, then take good heed that you avoid scratching or tender lean hatches, but rather endeavor to make your hatches somewhat broad, and yet likewise must you draw them from the fine or sharp to the broad. Then some shades must be drawn with hatches, whether sharp or lean, or full and broad. Hatching, being a layered technique, was consciously drawn to build up a three-dimensional effect in less than three or four layers. The first light lines established the overall general shade and were usually applied either curved to depict roundness or straight to depict level or flat areas of the form's surface. After the ink had dried, the next layer of hatches served as the immediate shadow. The final layer of hatches were applied in any direction, whether in fine or broad hatches, to deepen shadows and add details as needed. These last lines were to be applied judiciously with a masterly touch and understanding. From Faith Horn's manuscript, these image plates illustrate the logic of the step-by-step -step hatching process. By the 19th century, the art of hatching quickly became obsolete. Artists would discover through the new inventions of lithography and photography that flat tonal drawings were less tedious, quicker to produce, and easier to understand. Compare both these academy drawings. Notice the hatchings in the red chalk drawing to the right from the 1700s, especially how attention was given to allow the paper's rough texture to sparkle through adding a special glow of light within the shadows. Whereas, in the middle image of the 19th century approach, the paper surface is flattened with large, smudged-in areas of pronounced shadows. By the late 1800s, art students were copying from lithographed drawing books with stark tonal effects, as seen in the foot examples. Meanwhile, photography made artists think and see differently about their work, exploring and developing new understandings of visual interpretations. Observe the landscape photo on the upper left, especially how early photography, through the camera's monocular eye, recorded broad areas of lights and darks, obscuring details and depth. Artists recognized that the camera image revealed delineated flat areas of lights and shades, almost like a paint-by-number or a mosaic, which can be seen in the layout of the unfinished landscape drawing on the right. Notice here how the drawn lines establish boundaries for the direct and simultaneous coloring in of lights and shades. Eventually, 
as apparent in the three small images below, outlines would be eliminated to become pure, flat, directly applied tonal executions. This new working mindset would end the more concentrated and indirect or layered Renaissance drawing process. Of interest, note the dark tree branch in both the photograph and in Pissarro's painting, which has been altered into black and white for a better comprehension. Was this perhaps a likely intention of the painter after studying numerous early landscape photos? The next drawing technique mentioned in Gorhi's drawing manual is rustling. Rustling or stumping can only be accomplished with chalk or charcoal, a manner that, as Gorhi describes, is used to bring any pleasantness, sweetness, or meltings in your draft. Therefore, accustom yourselves to smooth your draft here and there, where occasion serves, a little with the tip of your finger. He instructs how to begin. Do it first faintly, smooth, and even in hatches close to one another and straight against the edges of light. Then dulcel it in such a way that it may appear as if it had been washed lightly with a pencil. Then shade your draft here and there, dulceling in the darkest shades. Regarding applying heightenings on colored paper, Gorhi mentions... The edges of the heightenings are smoothed a little also, and in this way you may conveniently make any edges not appear too hard or sharp. Gorhi warns, however, not to smooth too many shades, one into another, for this produces a workmanship that is hard, frozen, and flat, as seen in the previous slide of the 19th century Academy drawing. Here are close-ups from Michelangelo's drawing where one can see applied rustling, for instance, in the deep shadowed areas of the face and shoulder. Ever so slight are additional rustlings up against the lights to appear like washes with a brush. Other areas have hatchings applied on top of the softer blendings to revitalize the visual texture of the paper. And also, Gorhi mentions, Take care to leave convenient feints of the ground of your paper between your heightenings and shades, which will give a great luster to your heightenings and shadows. Michelangelo employed some delicate heightenings as well. These very light touches can be seen on the nose, cheek, and on top of the shoulder. White chalk was applied over a dark line, likely as a visual correction. Michelangelo also lightly dosled white chalk over some hatched shadings as seen in the hip area, on the cheekbone, and forehead. This is evident due to a bluish tint over the warmer red chalk. A sharp art connoisseur's eye will notice that the overall drawing appears slightly cooler and smoother along the light areas of the face to the deltoid and shoulder blade down the rib cage and into the hip, when compared to the shadowed side of the figure's back, which appears warmer. Applying delicate blendings of white chalk on top of shadowed areas, or also in reflected lights, was a common 16th, 17th century technique that would enhance a more lifelikeness of glowing skin. This focus study by Leonardo da Vinci, shows a partial finished drawing. Black chalk with some ink wash served as an underdrawing, with the application of color and heightenings on top. Note the subtle hatches in the heightening of the thigh, which are curved to emphasize the roundness of the form. Also observe how he allowed the paper surface to sparkle through, maintaining the general shade of the cream color to remain evident in the intermediate shades. Leonardo's unique drawing manner had a certain smokiness or blurriness, both in the shadows and along the contours, which enabled his lights to glow with a mysterious quality. In his notebooks, he wrote, 
that a shadow will never form a true image of the contours of the body. Thus, edges would melt into the darkness or into a softness, especially on rounded forms. Of interest, according to the New Oxford American Dictionary, the word sfamato did not exist in Leonardo's day. It was an Italian term of the mid-19th century that art historians began using as a catchphrase to describe the master's smoky technique. The last drawing technique described by Gori is washing, which is performed with a brush dipped in ink upon white or colored papers. Gorhi writes, In washing you shall observe this, that your proper and right known shadows are laid in at first weak, faint, smooth, and even, without smoothing the same at the edges, except it be by a second stroke, performed by a pencil, wetted a little with your tongue. This now being dry, where you perceive that a darker shade must be, go over that shade, observing that you use your ink a little darker than the first was, observing always not to make your work too harsh. After this is dried, you may set some harder touches without smoothing. Gorhi also mentions, and I quote, that you may wash therewith in any draught the principal shades, and afterward you may work over the same with the ink pen or black chalk loosely, which is a good and masterlike manner and presents itself exceedingly well. In this sketch, notice that it was first entirely outlined with a black chalk as seen in the distance, and then the lightest shades of brown wash were laid in throughout the composition according to the concept of distant grounds. Details and darker washes of brown ink were built upon successive dried layers, working from general to specific. The dark foreground is a wash of charcoal and brown ink combined, with careful attention to detail. Lastly, hatchings of black chalk were applied on top to enhance select areas within the sketch. Also note that the far distant hills in black chalk have been washed in some areas, creating a bluer shade against the warm tones of the brown ink. This creates a thickness of air effect, whereby shadows become lighter and colors cooler with less vibrancy when receding into the horizon. Something else has to be said again about line. Master artists in the 15 and 1600s realized the expressive power of line alone to achieve visual depth, an artistic innovation in its day. Consider this masterful sketch by Rembrandt, drawn by Brush and Reed. From a few simple lines, the Dutch master achieved spatial depth through aerial perspective. He employed darker, thicker lines of shadow to jump forward against the faint lines in the far distance. This is the visual force of a simple dark mark on paper. It will always appear to jump out above the paper surface and closer to the viewer's eye. Note also the use of the fence and reeds to the left to enhance the perspective towards the vantage point and eye level line. The structures are lightly washed to give a sense of solidity. Such masterly abstraction evident in just a simple, quick scribble. When the French Royal Art Academy came into existence in 1648, a contrived intellectual interest arose that required academic drawers and painters to employ measuring devices like those of an architect. One must understand that from ancient Greece to today, architecture has been considered the highest art form of human achievement, with painting second, sculpture third. This has been a lasting, prevalent opinion upheld for centuries. To increase the significance of painting, the tools of an architect were thus imposed as part of the drawing process in the academies. 
Here we see a French drawing set from 1690 with all its measuring devices. Additionally, the mention of plumb lines, compasses, siding grids, and measuring sticks began to frequently appear in the drawing publications of the late 1600s into the 1700s. Even the revised editions of earlier art books would have information arbitrarily added in by staunch proponents of the new drawing methods. Here we see drawing illustrations employing some of the measuring implements. The top left image shows a painter's workroom with the obvious calibers raised up high. A plumb line is on the floor on the lower left corner. In the bottom right, note the early beginnings of today's site size measuring. The top right example is a copied page from Rubin's Lost Theoretical Notebook showing a plumb line in use. However, the plumb line is not being employed as a measuring device, but rather as a visual aid demonstrating to the student how to judge the balance of a figure in various stances. The middle image is from a rare Bosse publication, which assisted painters to employ the illusionistic projection of perspective onto ceilings and vaults of various configurations. In this case, artists had to work side by side with architects and thus understand their tools of the trade. Here the implements would be used logically and properly by mature and masterful artists in order to successfully design their paintings on such grand high walls with complex viewing angles and dimensions. This would be about the necessary understandings and accuracies of perspectives and how their compositions had to agree to such optical rules for the visual illusion. However, for the young picture drawer, learning alternatives on how to draw were known and were either encouraged or discouraged by their instructors. One such visual tool was a threaded grid on an open frame, as seen in these illustrations. This siding grid had been employed by Dürer, Mantigna, and Alberti, primarily for scientific reasons of optical understandings, such as point of sight, the visual cone, and grid floors. Additionally, such siding grids aided in perspectives and foreshortenings of objects and figures. The device became a popular visual means for many artists of the late 1400s to the mid-1500s to copy land and cityscapes from the views of windows, as seen in the image at the upper right. By the late 1600s, artists no longer considered the scientific and optical discoveries from their predecessors, but rather used the sighting grid to obtain an exact drawing accuracy, especially in portraitures. The sighting grid is also mentioned in a manuscript with some disparagement. Arnold Hochbrochen, known for receiving first-hand information from former Rembrandt students, mentioned in his 1718 manuscript that the 17th century Rembrandt student Gareth Dow painted everything with great passion and patience, using a square grid on a frame. This is used by them who do not trust drawing with the free hand. It is banned by many because of its slowness. It is well known that Rembrandt never used such a device, so Dow, perhaps influenced by the latest fad practiced in the art academies, incorporated the siding grid into his own personal practice. The unfortunate overuse of measuring devices and siding grids for drawing would become a crutch to academically trained art students. They would be denied a true development of their own natural inclination, individual expression, and mature judgment that only freehand drawing can prove. Recognizing this danger in his own time, a concluding statement is added in Gorhi's book. 
here be contradiction. It is observable enough that when you proportion a figure according to the measures and divisions of a pillar or building, like as a carpenter does in architecture with a pair of compasses, then such figures, instead of loose and living motions, will show and represent nothing but wooden and stiff hedge stakes. As such, you may easily lose the well-becoming and pleasing beauty of the life and occupy yourself in all occasions with manual and active mensuration. For as much the use of this knowledge ought to have instead its exercise and practice in the understanding of drawing itself and a requisite good judgment of becoming the master of the work. I conclude with the words of that famous picture drawer and sculptor Michel Angelo, who said, A picture drawer in his drawings must keep the compasses in his eyes and not in his hands.